Tonight, the issues and the controversy. A thousand people have gathered at the City College of New York for a town meeting with Nelson Mandela. Ladies and gentlemen, Nelson Mandela. Town meeting with Nelson Mandela. Mr. Mandela, you're participating in what is a very old and honorable American tradition, the town meeting. And rather than waste any time with my questions, if they don't ask you good ones, I promise I will try to. But I think we have some people out here who have some provocative and perhaps even controversial questions to ask you. And I'd like to begin. Mr. Mandela, you've come to the United States of America. Other than South Africa, probably the most racially divided country in the world. Evidence of that is right here in New York City. We are one of the most racially divided cities in the world. The blood of our children stained the sidewalks of New York. Howard Beach, Benson Hurst, Yusef Hawkins, Michael Griffith, our grandmothers, Eleanor Bumpers, mothers, Yvonne Smallwood. If I may just ask you, uh, for your indulgence, if you'd be good enough, there will be some questions you'll like, there'll be some questions you won't like. Let me just ask you, though, to save the time so that we can listen to Mandela's answers. Mr. Mandela's answers. Mr. Mandela. After the rousing welcome I have received here, I do not know whether I am in a mood to think coolly. I have been deeply touched by this warm welcome. But to respond to the question, I must say that uh, the ANC and in fact uh, the entire to promote the struggle against apartheid in our country. And I must say to you that uh, we have the support not only of the masses of the people we have the support of the Congress as well as the government. And I think that uh, it would not be proper for me to delve into the controversial issues which are tearing the society of this country apart. I am sure that uh, the USA has produced a competent leaders of all, of all population groups who are able to handle their own affairs very effectively. Let me follow up, if I may, on part of your answer. You say you're sure you have the support of the people, the Congress, and the leadership. The, by the leadership, you also mean the President of the United States? Are you satisfied that you have his support? Well, I am sure of one thing, that he condemns apartheid as I do. That is enough for us to find further common room with the president. And this is the message that I'm going to put to him when I meet him. And when you say you have the support of Congress, are you satisfied that you have enough votes in Congress to keep sanctions that in place? That I cannot say that lies in the future. But when I address Congress, 
the main thrust of my speech is that the Congress should support sanctions. Why are you so insistent, Mr. Mandela, and then we'll go to a question at this microphone over here. <clears throat> Why are you so insistent upon maintaining sanctions at a time when it can be argued that the South African government has made more concessions, your release being only one of them, than it has ever made in the past 40 years? I should know better about this matter, Mr. Coppel, than you. No doubt. After all, it is the ANC, not the government, that is responsible for the present talks. We have been hammering the government since 1986 to meet us, and in spite of the humiliating and insulting conditions they tried to impose on us before they could agree to meeting us, we nevertheless had sufficient patience and sufficient commitment to peace as to continue hammering them to meet us. They have eventually done so, but despite the fact that uh, the talks are now uh, on, apartheid is still in place. The police are still killing our people, as they've done over the years. Vigilante groups are openly arming themselves for the specific purpose of attacking progressive groups and progressive leaders. The right wing is also arming it itself openly, and they say they are doing so for the purpose of destroying the ANC. They are calling for some of us to be hanged. Why would you think that uh, we should now relax our strategies? What has happened? Let's move on to the next question. Amanta, my name is Gloria Toot. I was born here in Harlem. I'm a lawyer. I've lived here all my life. I'm also on the board of directors of uh, the African Educational Foundation that's raising money to train the people of Africa for industry. I am concerned about the future economy of South Africa. I am concerned when I look at the newer countries that gained their freedom so hard fought indeed did not demonstrate sound fiscal policy. Illiteracy is still quite large and hunger. What can assure me as a human being and a concerned African American that the ANC will indeed have a fiscal solvent policy that will continue the use of the resources of South Africa in a meaningful way? Or should I put it more succinctly, will your economy be based on the Marxist system Socialism or capitalism, or both? I knew that the, that, that was the question you wanted to ask. <laughs> <clears throat> I am happy that you have had the courage to put it directly. <laughs> we are not concerned with models. We are not concerned with labels. We are practical men and women whose solutions are dictated by the actual conditions existing in our country. As somebody has said, we do not care whether the cat is black or white as long as it can catch mice. <clears throat> If, if I may... What we want, what we want to achieve is a healthy and vibrant economy which can ensure full employment to our people, maximum production, and the development of social justice. We wanted to rectify the imbalances that exist in our economy. One of the companies, well-known companies in the country, one company owns more than 75% of the shares quoted in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. This is illustrative 
of how our economy is organized. It is more the, the, the resources of the country are monopolized by a white minority, even in that minority by a few individuals, whereas the masses of the people, especially blacks, are left poor, ridden with disease, illiteracy, without educational facilities. We wanted to develop an economy which will put an end to that and will leave to other people to put a label if they so wish. Mr. Mandela, forgive me. And we are back once again. And uh, Mr. Mandela, as I told you before we began this broadcast, uh, almost all the questions will be coming here from the audience, but we also went to a couple of people back in South Africa, told them you were going to be on the broadcast, and asked them if they had any questions for you or comments that they wanted to make to you. One of those from whom we are about to hear now, and I'd like you to address your attention over to that monitor, is a man by the name of Kus van der Merwe, who's one of the leaders of the Conservative Party. Have a listen to what he has to say. Hello, Nelson. I'm a South African. I'm an Afrikaner. I want self-determination for my people in a part of South Africa. You can't have the whole South Africa for yourself. A part of it belongs to my people. Nelson, you're not going to nationalize the assets of the white people. I have worked for my banks, my mines, my businesses, and my farms. You are not going to take it. Stop your violence. Stop your sanction campaign. Stop your nonsense. Leave the violent campaign alone and come and sit down, become a normal person and talk and maybe that way we can find solutions. And lastly, forget communism, Nelson, it's gone. And I hope you will be well, I believe you were ill, I hope you will recover and have a good journey. Ek hoop van harte dat een dag ek de geleendheid sal kry om met u te gesels. Well, just to interpret Please. what I said, <laughs> I just wanted to demonstrate that I am bilingual. All I have said to Kurs van der Merwe is to say I am happy to know you. I hope that one day we shall have the opportunity to discuss the affairs of our country. That is all. Now, let me pick up, if I may, Mr. Mandela, though, on, on what Kurs van der Merwe had to say. He represents, as you know, a small but significant segment of the white population in South Africa, which is pressuring Mr. de Klerk from that political side of the spectrum. To what degree do you feel any need to help President de Klerk deal with people like Kus van der Merwe? Mr. de Klerk is an independent Resource, resourceful and flexible leader. He is able on his own to deal with the right wing. The outside world will be making a grave mistake if they think they can do anything whatsoever to help Mr. de Klerk as against the right wing. In fact, for the international community to seek to do anything expressly to help Mr. de Klerk would be the best way of undermining him because what the right wing is doing 
is to tell the whites in South Africa that the Klerk is a puppet of the United States and Great Britain. And that what he's doing now is precisely because he has received instructions from those two countries. And if now the Western world comes out to say they want to help the Klerk, that is what the right wing exactly wants. You will destroy him. We, the ANC, are the only people who can help him. And we are doing our very best to help him. One of the points we are putting to him is that uh, Mr. De Klerk, if he wants to see the future non-racial South Africa emerge, is to speed up in regard uh, to the negotiating process that uh, in a year or two he should be able to extend the vote to all South Africans. He must cease uh, thinking in terms of solutions by seeking a mandate to whites only. He must place himself in a position where he can get the support of the overwhelming majority of the people of South Africa. And if he gives every man and woman, whatever the color of his skin, the right to vote, he will be in an extremely strong position and there's nothing that the right wing can do. But if he continues, as he is doing at the present moment, still to think of racist solutions, solutions which are seen first and foremost as protecting the rights of the whites, he will go under. Let us move on to our next questioner at the microphone over there. Mr. Welcome to America, Mr. Mandela. I'm Ken Edelman. Those of us who share your struggle for human rights and against apartheid have been somewhat disappointed by the models of human rights that you have held up since being released in jail. You've met over the last six months three times with Yasser Arafat, who you have praised. You have told Gaddafi that you share the view on, and applaud him on his record of human rights and his drive for freedom and peace around the world. And you have praised Fidel Castro as a leader of human rights and said that Cuba was one of the countries that's head and shoulders above all other countries in human rights, despite the fact that documents of the United Nations and elsewhere show that Cuba is one of the worst. I was just wondering, are these your models of leaders of human rights? And if so, would you want a Gaddafi or an Arafat or a Castro to be a future president of South Africa? One of the mistakes which some political analysts make is to think that their enemies should be our enemies. That we can and we will never do. We have our own struggle which we are conducting. We are grateful to the world for supporting our struggle. But nevertheless, we are an independent organization with its own policy. And the attitude of every country towards our attitude towards any country is determined by the attitude of that country to our struggle. Yeah. Yasa Arafat. Colonel Gaddafi, Fidel Castro, support our struggle to the hilt. <laughs> the
There is no reason whatsoever why we should have any hesitation about hailing their commitment to human rights as they are being demanded in South Africa. Our attitude is based solely on the fact that they fully support the anti-apartheid struggle. They do not support it only in rhetoric. They are placing resources at our disposal for us to win this fight. That is the position. Mr. Mandela, you've, uh, you've said a number of very controversial things in that last response, and I'd like to come back to some of them when we return, but once again, we have to take a quick break. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you. The Cabo Report will continue in a moment. And we are back once again uh, with Nelson Mandela at the City College of New York. Mr. Mandela, as I mentioned to you before the program, we also have some distinguished guests sitting behind us. Uh, one of whom, uh, Mr. Henry Sigmund, together with two other Jewish leaders, came to Geneva to visit with you precisely because they were so concerned not only by the kind of thing that you just said before the break with regard to Yasser Arafat, with regard to uh, Libya's Colonel Gaddafi, uh, but also because of the support uh, that you seemed at different times to give to the PLO. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Sigmund to, to stand now for a moment uh, and pose whatever question he would like directly to you. Mr. Sigmund? Before I pose my question, uh, permit me to say first that when I had the, the pleasure and honor of meeting with Mr. Mandela in Geneva, we said to him, and I would like to repeat this now in order to put my question in context, that the commitment of the Jewish organizations that met with him to the struggle against apartheid, against racism, against injustice in South Africa is absolutely unconditional. It is not dependent on whether we are happy or unhappy with responses that Mr. Mandela gives to some questions. Having said that, Having said that, I think I would be dishonest if I did not express profound disappointment with the answer that Mr. Mandela gave to the previous question, because it suggests a certain degree of amorality. The, it suggests that the, what these people do in their own countries, what a Gaddafi does in Libya, what a, what a uh, Castro does in Cuba is totally irrelevant even in terms of the issue of, of human rights as long as they support the cause of the ANC. I hope that is not what Mr. Mandela meant and I would hope that he would clarify that issue further. Mr. Mandela. Firstly, we are a liberation movement which is fully involved in a struggle to emancipate our people from one of the worst racial tyrannies the world has seen. We have no time to be looking into the internal affairs of other countries. It is unreasonable for anybody to think that this is our role. I have been asked by somebody who wants me to express an opinion on the differences that are taking place within the USA. And he has made his position quite clear that there is racialism in this country. I have refused to be drawn into that. Why should Mr. Sigmund accept my refusal to be withdrawn into the internal affairs of the United States?
and at the same time want me to be involved in the internal affairs of Libya and uh, uh, Cuba. I refuse to do that. As far as Yasser Arafat is concerned, I explained to Mr. Sidney that we identify with the PLO because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. I went further, however, to say that the support for Yasser Arafat in his struggle does not mean that the ANC has ever doubted the right of Israel to exist as a state legally. We have stood quite openly and firmly for the right of that state to exist within secured borders. But, of course, as I said to Mr. Signal in Geneva and others, that we carefully define what we mean by secure borders. We do not mean that uh, Israel has the right to retain the territories they conquered from the Arab world, like the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and uh, the West Bank. We don't agree with that. Those territories should be returned to the Arab people. Mr. Mandela. I also explained to Mr. Sigmund and company that in our organization, we have Jews. In fact, Mr. Gaddafi did not allow us to open our offices in Libya precisely because we had the courage to say to him, we work with the Jews in our organization. And he didn't uh, allow us to open an office until February this year when he had to accept us as we are. We are not prepared to be swayed by anybody. We have an independent policy which we accept no matter with whom we discuss. Mr. Mandela, let's move on to our next question. Welcome. My name is Malcolm Dunn. I'm from Plainfield, New Jersey, and I'm chairman of the United Minority Business Brain Trust in New Jersey and the national chairman of the American uh, Legal Defense Fund for the uh, uh, minority business organizations. I have a question that relates to our participation in business in this country. We who have gained the moxie and who have reached certain uh, levels of proficiency in business and education in various professions uh, would like to know what can we offer? What can we who have been denied access, total absorption into the American system in those professions what can we prepare ourselves to offer to you in the motherland, given your attainment of the one vote, one person, one vote? I ask this in the context of Eastern European countries being free and the money that was formerly sent to uh, uh, Africa is now being diverted to those Eastern European countries. I ask also in the context that though our country has opened up its doors to people of a lighter hue before they have absorbed us fully in this country. And if you have an answer to my question, please let me know who I can contact after this assemblage to keep up the dialogue. Thank you. The black people of America, of the USA, have a lot to offer the people of South Africa in the course of their struggle. Whatever disabilities you have in this country, at least you have been exposed to opportunities which we don't have. 
you have better educational facilities. There is no legal color bar in this country. And therefore, you have been able to acquire, in spite of your problems, you have been able to acquire expert knowledge, skills, which we require, especially when during the post apartheid South Africa, you can help us a great deal by making that expertise available to us. As far as the question of who you can contact, keep in contact with in our country, that we can discuss after this occasion. All right. We're going to take another quick commercial break and then we'll be back in a moment. The Koppel Report, a town meeting with Nelson Mandela, continues. Once again, Ted Koppel. Mr. Mandela, as I mentioned to you also uh, before you came out here this afternoon, uh, there are black leaders in South Africa with whom you and your organization have differences. One of them who represents uh, many of the Zulu people, political organization known as Inkata, is Gacha Butelezi. If you'd be good enough to direct your attention once again to the monitor and listen to what he has to say. I know, my dear, that you are not responsible for our not getting together, and I know that it's other people that have said, they've said, I'm not imagining it, they've said it in so many words that they don't want you and I to get together. But, my dear, all these years you have been incarcerated, you know we've been in touch. We you know that I've always paid tribute to you, that I've refused, you know, to negotiate with any of the white leaders in this country for, for, for decades now, because I told them that it was an absolute non-negotiable that I, I can get to the conference table without you and your, our brothers who were incarcerated with you and others and before the unbending of ANC, PAC and other organizations. So I think in your absence, you might be interested to know that one of our brothers who is very close to you has been to see me He'll have a certain message for you when you return. And I said to myself that it's absolutely up to you. Because there's nothing that prevents you, even in the United States, to pick up a telephone and, and say hello and talk to me as we're doing ever since you left jail. Uh, Shanga, <clears throat> I do not think it correct for me to wash our dirty linen in a foreign country, even though it is an hour of all. I am hesitant to do that, even though here I have the feeling that I am among comrades in arms, brothers and sisters. One thing I would like to dispel with all the force at my command is that uh, there is no difference whatsoever between myself and my organization on the attitude towards Inkata and yourself in person. If I have not seen you, it is because of decisions which we have carefully discussed amongst ourselves and of which I am part. I, however, would like her to repeat what you know. I have said on numerous occasions, I would like the ANC and Inkata to sit down and resolve our problems and end the violence that is going on today in Natal. But you know as well as I do that the question is no longer simple. The government 
has taken advantage of the differences between my organization and your organization. They are using those differences for the purpose of trying to eliminate the ANC and what they consider to be members of that organization who are a threat to white supremacy. That now is our problem. It is no longer just a question of me meeting you. I have asked Mr. de Klerk the simple question. I have said to him, you have a strong, efficient, and well-equipped army and police force. Can you tell me why the government has failed to suppress violence in which almost 4,000 blacks have been killed? <laughs> Mr. de Klerk has never been able to give a satisfactory answer to my question. I have told him, I've given him the answer. I have said to him, you have not suppressed this violence deliberately because you believe that by using these differences between these two organizations, you can crush your enemy number one, the ANC. That is your difficulty. And I must repeat to you, that is the main problem facing the people of South Africa. It is the involvement of the government and its police in the violence that is taking place in Natal. We have, Mr. Mandela, uh, I believe on microphone B over there, a former representative of the South African government. He was until very recently the Consul General here in New York. Would you like to come to the microphone and pose your question? That is so, Mr. Corporal. Mr. Mandela, as one who for a period of years has advocated your unconditional release, I want to say at the outset, I'm delighted to see you here in New York. Welcome. Thank you. Secondly, I also commend you for your loyalty to your friends, controversial though that may be. But in framing my question, in dealing with Natal in particular, I, as a white South African, am most concerned about the bloodletting, the carnage that is going on. And whilst I take the point that you've made that the police possibly and probably could do more, I do believe that the challenge or the ball is in your court, Mr. Mandela, because one cannot, we as South Africans cannot afford to have South Africans killing South Africans. We've got to have peace, harmony, a strong economy. We've got to hold out our hands to each other so we can build the new South Africa with a minimum of bitterness. I believe, sir, that you are the statesman who can do it. I would like to do, you to do it, and I'd like you to issue a call. I'd like you to extend the hand to Chief Gacha Butelezi, irrespective of political differences, irrespective of dirty linen, irrespective of what has gone before. I believe you owe it to each other and the country to see that we have a stable, secure platform on which to go forward together, white, black, and brown. I hope you agree. I do not consider your remarks as a lecture to me. Because, because you would know that it is the ANC and not the government that has compelled the government to sit down and talk peace with us. It is the ANC that is mobilizing the entire country today around the question of peace. You would also know that I have made several calls at public rallies that no solution is possible in South Africa without involving Chief Mutelezi. You would know this. Yeah, yeah. I have made that call not once, but several times. But it is the government that is responsible for all our problems in regard to Natal. The questions that I have put to Mr. De Klerk, 
he has not been able to answer. I wonder if you can answer them. The government has had no hesitation whatsoever in suppressing similar violence before. Why is it that it has not even attempted to suppress that violence? After all, no government anywhere in the world can tolerate violence in which close to 4,000 people have been killed without intervening. Why is your government not intervening? That is the question that you must answer. Uh, I would answer you by saying that I don't represent the government and I would hope that the government would do exactly what you say. I do not quarrel with you and I do not presumptuously lecture you, Mr. Mandela. I wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. You. Mandela. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have ripped through the first part of this broadcast extraordinarily quickly. There are still a number of issues that we have to take up with Mr. Mandela, not the least of them being sanctions by the United States against South Africa. I'm Ted Koppel at the City College of New York, and this is a special edition of Nightline. Nelson Mandela, day two of his visit to the United States. More celebration more adoring crowds. A reminder to his people of how far they have come. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, we have risen up as on the wings of eagles. A reminder of how far they have yet to go. The old order is crumbling. But the age of freedom has not yet done. Ladies and gentlemen, Nelson Mandela. And in the middle of his day, an extraordinary town meeting, part of which you may have seen, but for those who missed it, here's a sampler. We identify with the PLO. Because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. Mandela displayed a sense of humor. Or should I put it more succinctly? Will your economy be based on the Marxist system, socialism, or capitalism? Or both? I knew that that, that was the question you wanted to ask. <laughs> He responded to his critics at home. Monitor is a man by the name of Kurs van der Merwe, who's one of the leaders of the Conservative Party. Have a listen to what he has to say. Nelson, you're not going to nationalize the assets of the white people. I have worked for my banks, my mines, my businesses, and my farms. You are not going to take it. Stop your violence. Stop your nonsense. All I have said to Kurs van der Merwe is to say I am happy to know you. I hope that one day we shall have the opportunity to discuss the affairs of our country. There is nothing that prevents you, even in the United States, to pick up a telephone and, and say hello and talk to me as we are doing ever since you left jail. For me, to wash our dirty linen in a foreign country, even though it is an hour of all. I am hesitant to do that, even though here I have the feeling that I am among a comrades in arms. Welcome to America. He faced his critics here, head on. Those of us who share your struggle for human rights and against apartheid have been somewhat disappointed by the models of human rights that you have held up since being released in jail. You've met over the last six months three times with Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat. Colonel Gaddafi. Fidel Castro, 
support our struggle to the hilt. I think I would be dishonest if I did not express profound disappointment with the answer that Mr. Mandela gave to the previous question, because it suggests a certain degree of amorality. The Above all, Nelson Mandela stated his positions forcefully. <clears throat> Why are you so insistent upon maintaining sanctions at a time when it can be argued that the South African government has made more concessions, your release being only one of them, than it has ever made in the past 40 years? I should know better about this matter, Mr. Coppel, than you. No doubt. And now, in the Nightline segment of our broadcast, there's much more to come. And we are back once again at the City College of New York with Nelson Mandela. And, Mr. Mandela, we have just heard a number of the things that you said in uh, our hour between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock this evening. Some controversial things, not the kinds of things necessarily that a very political man says. If you were very political, you might have been more concerned about not alienating some people in this country who have it within their hands, within their power, either to continue sanctions against South Africa or to raise those sanctions, to lift them. Why were you, why were you not a little more political? Perhaps we're too accustomed to politicians in this country. I do not understand what you mean. Perhaps uh, if uh, you clarify what you are referring to. I may be in a position to comment. What I'm saying <clears throat> is that in this country, for example, there has been for many years a close alliance between the Jewish population and the black population in the civil rights struggle. There is likely to be a rather negative reaction to some of the things that you have said. That reaction could very well cause people to call up their congressmen, their senators, and say, ah, go ahead, lift the sanctions. Why not? After all, President de Klerk is doing a great deal against apartheid. Only today, in fact, his number two man, Gerard Villeneuve, said that the government perceives itself in South Africa as being part of the anti-apartheid struggle. Ah. <laughs> One of the problems <clears throat> we are facing in the world today are people who do not look at problems objectively but from the point of view of their own interests that makes things difficult because once a person is not objective it is extremely difficult to reach an agreement one of the best examples of this is to think that because Arafat is conducting a struggle against the state of Israel, that we must therefore condemn him. We can't do that. It is just not possible for any organization of or individual of integrity to do anything of the sort. I don't also want to, want to leave secondly, the impression, uh, if, if I might just inter intervene with one point, I don't want to leave the impression that this is only going to be a Jewish black issue. There are a great many Cuban Americans in this country who will be just as offended by some of the comments you've made about Fidel Castro and Cuba. No, Mr. Coppel, I don't agree with you. I am saying that uh, it would be a grave mistake for us to consider our attitude towards Yasser Arafat on the basis of the interests of the Jewish community. We sympathize with the struggles of the Jewish people and their persecution right down the years. In fact, we have been very much influenced by the lack of racialism amongst the Jewish communities. In our own country, in the political trials that have taken place when few lawyers were prepared to defend us it has been the Jewish lawyers who have come forward to defend us I myself 
I myself was articled, I'm a lawyer by profession, and I was trained to become a lawyer by a Jewish firm at a time when few firms in our country were prepared to take blacks. <clears throat> and as I have said, we have many Jews, uh, members of the Jewish community in our struggle, and they have occupied very top positions. But that does not mean to say that uh, the enemies of Israel are our enemies. We refuse to take that position. You can call it being political or uh, a moral question, but uh, for anybody who changes his principles depending on whom he is dealing, that is not a man who can lead a nation. Apparently, Mr. Koppel, you have not listened to my argument. If you have done so, then you have not been serious in examining it. I have replied to one of our friends here that I have refused to be drawn into the differences that exist between various communities inside the USA. <clears throat> You have not commented that I am going to offend anybody by refusing to involve myself in the internal affairs of the USA. <clears throat> of the USA. <laughs> Why are you so keen that I should involve myself in the internal affairs of Cuba and Libya? No. I expect you to be consistent. I don't know if I have paralyzed you. No, 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 no. I... I'm afraid, Mr. Mandela, that, that paralysis does not set in quite that easily in my case. The point, uh... Uh, Since I've just about recovered from my paralysis, I want to come back to that question in just a moment. But first, we need to take a break. The point that I was trying to make, and, and clearly did not make uh, with any great success, but the point that I was trying to make is that you must not be misled by what is, after all, what in this country we call a hometown crowd. These people are very much with you. You have seen that. The people who come out to see you, the people who will come to Yankee Stadium to see you, the people who line the motorcade routes to see you, you don't have to convince them. They are people who already believe in you and believe in your cause. But this is a very large and diverse country. And when I was making my observations about the, the lack of politicism, and in this country saying someone is not a politician is not meant as an insult necessarily. Uh, when I was accusing you of a lack of, of political qualities there, I was wondering whether you are conscious of the impact that you will have on a great many people who are not here today, who do not see you in perhaps the same benign fashion that so many people in this audience see? Well, as far as the Jewish question to begin with, I have had discussions at my own initiative with prominent Jewish leaders to straighten out this affair. 
Amongst the people I saw was Mrs. Helen Sussman, who has been an MP in our country for more than 30 years. There was Mr. Mazens, who has been a judge in Lesotho, Botswana, and the old Rhodesia. There was the chief rabbi of Johannesburg. There was Professor Katz from the University of Witwatersrand, and an eminent uh, community leader in, in South Africa. We discussed this question, and all misunderstanding was clear, the question of Yasser Arafat and the PLO. I have also discussed the question with uh, the Jewish leaders in the USA and very top people like Mr. Sigmund. We reached an agreement on this question and we saw eye to eye. Now, I don't know where your concern arises. The Jewish leaders themselves are able to determine their own affairs. Nobody else is entitled to say that uh, the Jewish leaders are going to be concerned about your stand. Let because me, I just a minute, sure. okay. because I have had the discussions with them, and those discussions will reach consensus. But uh, there are matters, of course, in which we did not agree. <clears throat> but uh, the position which we take as the ANC, I thought we were able to explain it in such a way that it removed the concern of the Jewish community. Let's broaden it up. I am still prepared to do that even in this talk. If the Jewish leader have any doubts about our stand, I am prepared to address them and to allay uh, their concern because they are a very important community both in South Africa and of course in the States. And I'm prepared to iron out any differences that might exist but they must know what our stand is. Arafat is a comrade in arms, and we treat him as such. Mr. Mandela, we need to take a break again. When we come back, we'll be taking up the issue of sanction, sure to be one of the major questions, one of the major topics of conversation, when our guest, Mr. Mandela, visits Washington at the beginning of next week. Allow me, Mr. Mandela, to broaden the subject out a little bit and to, to introduce now uh, another distinguished guest here, uh, Senator Boren, who indeed will be called upon very shortly to vote upon the issue of sanctions. Senator Boren, uh, I wonder if you'd be good enough to stand up and, and to give me your assessment of how much trouble do you think Mr. Mandela is going to have on this issue? How warmly will he be received in the U.S. Congress? Ted, I think he's going to be very warmly received by people in both parties and by the uh, administration as well. While there may be some differences of opinion on certain issues, uh, like uh, positions on Arafat and Gaddafi, I think the American people understand what has gone on in South Africa. We have seen families divided because they've been classified according to race. We know that people are denied the right to vote because of race. We know that people are detained and not even given a trial because of race. And the American people regardless of party or position on other issues, are not about to relieve the pressure until that system is changed. One question, Ted. I do think that many of us understand that there are pressures being exerted, that Mr. Mandela and President de Klerk, as they start toward negotiations, have extremists on both sides who really do not want to see them succeed, who do not want to see a peaceful transition. And we're concerned. I understand why we must not release the pressure, and I think there's a bipartisan decision not to do that. The President has reached out to us in Congress to say that he will consult with us on any uh, future policy decisions that are made. But I wonder if there are some positive signals we could send, positive to both Mr. Mandela and to Mr. de Klerk as well, that would reach out to help South Africa, that would show our encouragement for these negotiations, and that perhaps could help the country as it does move to a non-racial democracy. Can, perhaps you, can helping, you give us a, well, a perhaps, uh, Senator, and then have Mr. Mandela perhaps respond? Perhaps helping the schools. I know that uh, Black children in school, only one out of every five even has a textbook because the past government has spent 
eight times as much educating white children as black children. Are there positive things we can do, Mr. Mandela, at this point to send a signal both to you and to Mr. De Klerk that we encourage progress in these negotiations that are going on? <clears throat> well, Mr. Koppel, I think I would have an easier task if you ask me to pass a vote of thanks to Senator Bond. He has said all the things that are required to be said in regard to the problems of South Africa. He has a very positive attitude and uh, he is constructive. He is one of those men who are concerned not with fights only in his own country, in his own region. He is one of those men who have selected the world as a theater for their own efforts, for their own operations. And it is refreshing to be in the presence of such a man. As far as giving a signal uh, to De Klerk is concerned, I have warned that uh, it will be a serious mistake for the outside world to do anything with the stated objective of helping Mr. De Klerk because it is that type of attitude which has enabled the right wing to increase its popularity as far as the whites are concerned. Please, whatever you do, don't do that. I have said the ANC is the best organization to help Mr. De Klerk. We are addressing that question. And uh, I might disclose to you now that we have already, that is the ANC, we have already started speaking to the right wing. We have already spoken to a very influential member of the right wing. And uh, those discussions were very posit uh, positive. And they raised hope for greater developments in our relations with the right wing. Don't interfere in this question. I, can, I accept your bona fides in this regard, but you are playing with fire if you think in terms of rewarding Mr. De Klerk, because you will undermine his position uh, considerably. <clears throat> we are, however, having discussions with Mr. De Klerk, and I am optimistic that uh, we are going to make progress. I think he is as determined as we are to see to it that South Africa becomes a non-racial society, free of all forms of racialism. I am convinced about this. The only respect in which you can give a signal uh, to both uh, the National Party, to both the government and the ANC, is to consult uh, both these organizations as to what you could do to facilitate the process of peaceful negotiations. It is not a matter that can be discussed in a meeting of this nature. This is an extremely sensitive matter which uh, if right, the right time, the time is right, and uh, the element of confidentiality is retained, there can be an exchange of opinion. But to think in terms of uh, rewarding one side, one party, and that is declared, is a serious mistake. You raise an interesting question. We're going to take a break, Mr. Mandela, but I hope that when we come back, let me pose the question to you right now. You can think about it for a second. You are speaking of not rewarding the two sides, and yet, of course, when it comes to rewarding the ANC, one of the things that you are doing over, the here, over here is trying to raise money for the ANC, which could be perceived by some as rewarding one side in this debate. I would like uh, just to take a pause now, and then when we come back, Good. I'll ask you to respond. Thank you. Back in just a moment. And we are back once again at the City College of New York with Nelson Mandela. Just before the break, Mr. Mandela, I raised with you the issue of the money that you are raising while you were here for the ANC 
Can that not be perceived as rewarding one of the sides in the struggle? And you were making the point that we should sort of stay out of this rewarding business. Well, I don't think that uh, we mean this. That means the same thing. What the certain sections of the international community are saying is that uh, Mr. De Klerk should be rewarded because he has done something to deserve that. And the first difficulty I have about that is that Mr. De Klerk has done nothing. We have done something. What are you rewarding him for? That's the first question. Well, let me, let me try and give the answer and have you respond. Your release, the release of other political prisoners, the recognition of the ANC, of the South African Communist Party, uh, now the lifting of the state of emergency in all provinces but Natal, those are actions which the ANC and your supporters have been asking for for many years. And some people would say, as each of these demands is met, the ANC is moving the goalposts on the field. Now, Mr. Coppell, you are entirely misinformed. <laughs> In the first place, the ANC ought never to have been banned. <laughs> Secondly, my comrades and I ought never have been sent to prison. The state of emergency ought never to have, to have been imposed. You are crediting Mr. De Klerk for rectifying his own mistakes, his own injustices. You must remember that in enforcing apartheid, many of our people have been killed and uh, many of our people have been executed for resisting a policy which the government now admits is an evil system. What are you rewarding him for as against that background? That is the question. Let me turn the we question around have if come, I may. Just a moment, uh, Mr. Copper. No. We have come here to say we are fighting against injustice. Help us as the masses of the people of South Africa who are living under repressive laws, a repressive system. Help us to destroy repression. There's no question of reward. We are not saying to the outside world, help us, reward us for having negotiated, initiated the peace talks. We are saying that reward should go to the people of South Africa as a whole, not to any particular organization. Could it not then be argued, Mr. Mandela, that you will use the same arguments no matter what, because clearly you would argue, and I think with some justice, that until South Africans have one man, one vote, until the system of apartheid in, in all of its aspects is removed, those are all injustices by your definition, correct? Are you then arguing that sanctions against South Africa should not be lifted until every one of those injustices is removed? The front, the people of South Africa, the frontline states, the organization of African unity, the non-aligned movement, the General Assembly of the United Nations are all agreed that until fundamental and irreversible changes take place in the policy of the country, sanctions must be maintained. I am not here putting forward the views of an individual or of an individual organization. I am putting to you what is being said by the entire world. They insist that sanctions should be maintained until fundamental and irreversible changes take place in the policy of the country. 
Mr. Mandela, we've just about used up all of your available time, but we will have time for just one more question when we come back in a moment. Mr. Mandela, I know that you are out of time. We are at least out of our time with you, but I wanted us to end on a point of wisdom. Uh, and when in doubt, always go to a youngster. Let's go for the last question to the young man at the microphone over there. My name is Bernard L. Charles III, and I'm eight years old. And I'm very glad you're, that you're fr free, Mr. Mandela. And um, if there's anything we, any of us can do, just send us a postcard with, with anything that you want us to do, and we'll do it. Even, even raise money. You want to come up here and ask some more questions? Yes, fine. <laughs> yeah. All right, while the young man comes down here. While the young man comes down here so that he can shake hands with Mr. Mandela, I would like to extend my thanks to Mr. Mandela, to all of our audience, and to our distinguished guests who've been with us here this evening. Come on up. Somebody got a piece of paper here. there, please. Oh, absolutely. We got, we got everything you need right here. Oh, I see. Good. There good. you go. Thank you. I've got one. I've got one. <laughs> what is your name? Bernard. How do you spell? Bernard. To Bernardo. Hmm? Bernardo. Just What's Bernard. your first name? B-E-R-N-A-R-D. Bernard. I see. Bernard. Well done, it. Thank you very much. This has been ABC News Nightline.